All right, so I had my exploratory conversation with Jeffrey Williams, and uh, went really well. Went exactly, almost exactly as I thought it was going to go. I've been seeing the stuff he wrote on Twitter, read a couple of his blogs, and I was pretty sure I already understood the page he was on to some degree, and it was just going to be what he called and what I agree was an exploratory conversation, a really good one at that. Um, and yes, JB, I did not have to break out Bigfoot. Why? Because there was no reason to. But let me just tell you a little something. Let me just set you straight about Bigfoot right now, JB. I don't care what you ultimately believe about God. That's between you and God. But you, at the end of two years, you are going to believe in Bigfoot and you're going to like it. You're going to be preaching Bigfoot to everybody on Twitter and YouTube. And you're going to be preaching Bigfoot as fervent as fervent can be. I mean, hallelujah, Bigfoot. That's my promise to you, JB. I don't care what you believe about God, but so help me God. <laughs> as sure as the sun shines in the morning, you ain't not going to stop the Sasquatch, JB. You are going to believe in Bigfoot if it kills me. So, I didn't have to bring up Bigfoot. Bigfoot is the big gun, JB. I say Bigfoot for someone who's, you know, got any evidence for your Sky Fairy. That's when I hit him with Bigfoot. Outside of that, that's my trump card, JB. I didn't have to play it. Why? Because it was a normal conversation. He wasn't being stubborn or irascible. We were having a civilized conversation. So I didn't have to hit him with the big gun of Bigfoot. But I promise you this, JB, irrespective of where you wind up on the question of theology, you are going to believe in Bigfoot if it kills me. If it kills me. You need Bigfoot. He doesn't. <laughs> you need Bigfoot, JB. He doesn't. Now, okay, so... <laughs> I thought it was fine, fine. It's not funny, Greg. I fine, whatever. Um, so it was a cool conversation. It's kind of almost exactly what I thought we were going to get at. Now, there's a lot that he put on the table that I don't know well enough, and I'm going to dive into um, particularly the physics on... He was talking about the Italian guy, Cavelli. Cavelli I was, for some reason, mysterious reason, I'm always forgetting his name. Um, and the... Um, Penrose. Now, I'm in the process right now of reading one of the books by the Italian guy, and I'm going to try to read the, the three, and then I'll start working them into the stuff that I talk about, because I think there's a real there there, and as far as I can tell from the stuff that Jeffrey was talking about, and this was just an exploratory conversation, so I'm not holding him accountable to every word he said, but the, the general gist of this quantum consciousness thing, which I think he was, was saying came more from Cavelli, um, it's a very, very plausible, it's very, very plausible. I do not think it is inconsistent with Castrop's idealism at all. Castrop's idealism is a kind of universal consciousness as a stream of consciousness, and it's pretty consistent as far as I can tell at first glance with some of the things that Jeffrey was postulating about um, fluctuations in the quantum realm, and I think he was talking about vibrations, and ultimately what consciousness is, is some sort of, um, you know, what's interesting about him, he calls himself an atheist, and he doesn't believe in God, but the conversation, as far as I was concerned, was really theist-friendly territory. If every atheist were an atheist like him, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be bothering making videos. Well, because everything he thinks, and there's a lot of stuff that we talked about that I 100% know for a fact. Like, for example, he started talking about playing his guitar so much that he was experiencing it as if the guitar was playing him. Now, that's common. That's a common occurrence in creative endeavors, where you feel like you're being played by the instrument. And I think he literally meant being played by the instrument. And that's transcendent in nature. Now, I know for a fact those type of experiences are real, because I've had them thousands of times. And what's interesting about that, he calls himself an atheist, and he doesn't think that that idea is theist-friendly. But that's part of why it was so easy for me to become a theist, is I had experiences like that all the time. One And there are, what drives me crazy about a lot of this, this crap that floats around in the atheist community, like, they can't all be right, but they can all be wrong, that's a common concept in a lot of core teachings of religion, particularly Zen Buddhism, where you practice something so much that you kind of become one with the thing. And it's somewhat mystical in nature. 
and it is somewhat transcendent in nature. And he even uses those words sometimes, mystical and transcendent. He doesn't use the word transcendent, but he uses mystical. Now, I get that he's an atheist in the sense he doesn't think it has anything to do with, you know, a God that's outside of or a God. But a lot of his bottom-up approach to these things, I almost know for a fact are true because I've experienced identical things. Just, just uh, for instance, when I was... Uh, there was one time when I was in seventh grade, I would play basketball on this basketball court. And I swear to God, it was just one court that was outside in seventh grade. And I, got, I would kill anybody on that court because I, I played so much in that one particular place. And it was very particular because it had a little divot hole and it was out on the concrete. And I, I had this killer jump shot that I just kept doing and doing and doing and doing and doing so much that nobody could stop it. And it was, it was, I was actually not very good outside of that court, but that court, I started becoming one on with that basketball court because I played there so much and I had this, like, invincible jump shot. Now, that's just a small example, but that's a, that's a common thing that happens in creative endeavors. In art, we started talking about Jimi Hendrix playing his guitar, you know, till three in the morning, fall asleep with his guitar in his lap wake up and play guitar, go out and play guitar, eat, sleep, breathe guitar, becoming one with your creative process. That's a, that's a common idea in Zen Buddhism and some of the philosophers that he talks about. Um, I know for a fact that that type of experience is true. I know that for a fact I've experienced it in music, in acting, in, you know, so... Some of the things that he were talking about, his bottom-up approach to... I guess he's not using the word transcendent, but he does use... The, I, don't, I don't exactly know what, how he's defining it. You know, I, I agree with almost all of it. And ironically, it's part of why it was really easy for me to become a Christian. Prior to me becoming a Christian, I would have called myself agnostic, but I was really, really open to the type of stuff he talks about. Similar, similar vein. Um, the person I mentioned uh, was Ralph Waldo Emerson... And uh, the, the actual, the, 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 famous, the famous essay is called Self-Reliance. And I was, that was really influential in me when I was like 22, 23 years old. When you're 22, 23 years old, one of the things that you are doing is you are floating around in the world. And I called myself an agnostic at the time, and I didn't believe in God. And it was more like I didn't really care about God at all. I wasn't interested in that. But I was really, really interested in what I was going to be what I was going to do with my life, and what was my destiny. Now, that concept is basically inseparable from some type of theistic understanding of reality, just a way of framing it. You know, what am I supposed to do with my talent? Like, what am I supposed to be in life, as if there is a thing to be? Now, he probably doesn't agree with that. But most of the other stuff, like, he doesn't agree with that, that framing. But most of the other stuff that he was talking about philosophically is actually, I think, theist-friendly territory. And that's why, you know, with Ralph Waldo Emerson, for example, his concept was universal mind, and it was like a universal consciousness that was really easy for me to kind of see in action in the world as I started to live my life. And a lot of people, you know... These type of ideas make sense intuitively to a lot of people. So they're not quite atheist ideas. They are way more theist-friendly in general. Or as I would describe them, theist-friendly. Yeah, atheists might disagree with that. But uh, the, 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 the physics that he was talking about, as far as I can tell, it's not completely incompatible with what... Bernardo Castro is postulating. There's basically, if, if the choice is binary, if the choice is between being an eliminative materialist and being an idealist, then idealism is the answer. The reason why he's not, he, he said idealism is possible because consciousness could be the ontological primitive and it's not inconsistent with this idea of quantum consciousness at all necessarily. I'd see them as kind of parallel ideas. I think if Castro were reading um, this guy, I think Castro would find a way to easily work it into his thesis. So I don't see it as inconsistent with, with idealism at all. And I see a lot of his ideas, 
which I tend to agree with almost everything he said. Like, almost everything he said, I was like, yeah, I agree. And a lot of the stuff that he was saying, I not only agree with it, but I'm almost sure, as he was saying it, like, the, 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 the experience of, of being played by something, I've had that experience. I know for a fact that's a real thing. Now, I call that spiritual nature or transcendent in nature. I don't know. He may use the word spiritual. He probably doesn't use the word transcendent. But I see that as theist-friendly ideas or theist-friendly territory. Um, it's an approach to life that is, you know, uh, I don't know. I get where, where he's coming from with, the, with the not tat attaching it to a personal deity, but this is why it's helpful for, you know, people to study comparative religion and see what, because these, these ideas are present in a lot of religious doctrines and a lot of religious teachings, and they come up time and time again. In some ways, they are perennial ideas that you can find very, very common and all over the place when you start really delving into certain religions. For example, um, when, when, when Castro was talking with, I forget exactly who, they started talking about Vedanta Hinduism, a form of Vedanta Hinduism, that's consistent with the type of physics we're talking about. So these ideas are there in religion, and it's, I mean, I guess he never really read, like, Christian mystics or Buddhist mystics, or um, their Christian existentialist, the one that comes to mind, Paul Tillich, but there's a lot of ideas in religious texts and associated very heavily with spiritual teachings that are completely consistent with everything that he said and believed. Now, a lot of the stuff he says and believes, or at least in terms of the physics, and this is why I'm going to start delving into the Italian guy he mentioned and uh, reading the books, because I think there's a way to actually work that into ultimately what I'm talking about on my channel. I'm assuming, because one of the, th one of the reasons why I went on Jeff's channel and wanted to talk to him is one of the things I noticed that he does that nobody else does when physics come up. If he writes a string of tweets about physics, he's usually t he's not talking out of his butt. I'm like, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, and as far as I know, that's right. So as like, he at least seems to be up to date on what's going on in the frontiers of quantum mechanics. Now, assuming that everything that he told me about Penrose and Cavalieri, I don't know why I can't get the name right. It's like, this is where my wife always calls me a moron. She says certain things, I just, I just go mysteriously dumb. <laughs> I swear to God, my wife always thinks I'm like, like what? <laughs> she thinks I'm like totally out of it half the time because there are certain things that I can't remember what that name is. But let's assume for argument's sake, and I'm already pretty much sure that the physics are going to check out exactly as Je Jeffrey is representing him, because in my experience, when he starts talking about physics, unlike other people in the space, he isn't talking out of his butt. He starts talking about things that are actually being said by the physicists he cites. So I'm going to delve into the book by the Italian guy whose name I can't remember, and... Uh, Il non ricordo niente, il non ricordo, hey, come here. <laughs> um, so, I will delve into the physics book, and assuming the physics check out as he is representing them, you know, I do not see this as... I see this as really theist-friendly territory. I really do. Um, I, I suggest you check out the conversation between me and Jeff. I thought it was a really cool conversation. And, as a follow-up, you can watch Christian Idealism and his, the second conversation they has, an awesome conversation too. Um, Christian idealism is on a lot of these same pages, and he knows who Bernardo Castro is, and he's bringing up a, a lot of the same stuff. So, I don't see anything that he deeply believes and talked about as inconsistent with theism as all, at all. I, the, I see it as mostly theist-friendly territory, and in fact, there are standalone examples of highbrow theists who would probably, who were philosophical in nature, would probably agree with almost everything he said. Paul Tillich comes to mind, Kierkegaard comes to mind, then there are Buddhist and Christian mystics who would probably agree with almost everything he said. So, assuming that his physics check out, you know, we'll see where this ultimately leads, but it looks like we're, we're entering a whole new phase of apologetics. Um, let's call it transcendent apologetics. And I guess it's atheist friendly to the degree that it's not demanding that you believe in any particular version of the Sky Fairy. 
you know, if, if, if you find my, my particular Sky Fairy too punitive, <laughs> too punitive and harsh, you know, you don't necessarily have to sign up to everything that I believe about my particular Sky Fairy. So in that sense, I guess it's atheist-friendly territory where it's not rigid and ideological in nature. It's not demanding that you believe everything that I believe. Um, again, the only thing I ultimately care about, guys, is the tides. I don't want to be too opportunistic and callow and materialistic, but since we're on the subject, everyone be clear about that fact. I really don't care. I just, I just want your freaking tides. And, like I said, I only have one goal in all this, and that is to make JB a Bigfoot disciple, preaching Bigfoot all over YouTube, all over Twitter, to anybody who will listen. Tell them why, why they need Bigfoot, JB. It's not just that they need Bigfoot. Tell them why. Tell them what to expect in life if they don't find Bigfoot and find him soon. So, there you have it. I thought it was a cool conversation. Uh, I admit that this particular video was a little bit rambly and <laughs> but the conversation was kind of rambly too but it was cool it was it is definitely worth hearing and it is the beginning of new new pages that I will be exploring as I try to process what I think are actually I think there are there the physicists he cite are actually legitimate physicists I know that for a fact and I think they're legitimately on the frontier of what is going on in quantum mechanics as far as my understanding is they are not inconsistent with the postulates by laid down by Bernardo Castro which I ultimately see his form of metaphysical idealism now it might ultimately be called something else this sort of quantum consciousness thing, whatever, whatever this is, I, I think it's a real breakthrough in terms of, I think it's something that is supported by the science and the physics and can be, uh, it, at least to me at first glance, it seems to me extremely, extraordinarily theist-friendly territory. So I am optimistic, cautiously optimistic that this will prove to be a fruitful endeavor and will help me collect the tithes even more, uh, even more fortuitous, <laughs> even more, even more, help me get even more tithes and really, really pile them up and that'll be good. So, there you have it, kids. That is all for now. I suggest you check out the convo between me and Jeffrey. I will post the link in the, in the, uh, in the little information zone, the little information box, and that is all for now. The Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.